Good morning, New Beginnings. Those of you who are here in the building and those of you online, God bless all of you today. Hallelujah. Let's, um, let's, let's stand up. We're going to be worshiping the Lord and let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our praises. We worship you. We give you glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, Scripture says in Psalms, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. I encourage you to sing unto the Lord a new song now and every day sing unto the Lord a new song he is doing new things all the time hallelujah we can praise him we can glorify him hallelujah so right now just lift up your voices to the Lord and give him thanks he's so good we thank you Lord you are
how many of you know that Jesus is our deliverer?
enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. No looking back, no looking back. Your love, your love, your love. dark to light. Jesus, you show me what freedom is. You call my name. You broke my shame. You are my deliverance. You are my deliverance.
I just want to speak the name Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows.
over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our praises. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us as we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for healing us as we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for delivering us as we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for setting us free as we praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory be to God. Um, <clears throat> you may be seated. <laughs> so this is the last Sunday before we're going to be doing the presentation of the gifts we've been, the gifts and the notes that we've been preparing for Pastor Russ and Linda. There's a card box out in the foyer um, before service for a time and after the service for a time. So if you can, um, if you want to be, uh, if you want to bless them by writing a note and or giving them a financial blessing, uh, go ahead and put that in the box at the end of this service. Those of you who are online, um, please mail anything you would want to send to Pastor Russ and Linda uh, to the address that Alex put up. And um, if you do write a check on the memo line, please write Pastor Appreciation so that it's separate from the tithes and the offerings. Um, and then we'll be presenting that to them next week. And today we have um, our guest speaker today is Katie Katina Lacey. <laughs> so let's welcome her. <laughs> Praise God. Well, since we're talking about Pastor Appreciation Month, I thought we would speak about it in the service today, too. And the title of the service is, Where Do I Fit In? Where do you fit in? Where do each one of us fit into the body of Christ? And it, it tells us that in Scripture. It tells us exactly where each one of us fit in. And let's read that in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. This is in the ESV. And he, God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all obtain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. <clears throat> Rather, teaching the truth in love, we grow up in every way unto him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together, held joined and held together by every joint 
which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When each part is working properly, that means there's lots of parts. And are they all working properly? So you have a part in the kingdom. I have a part in the kingdom. What is our part? And do you see yourself as a part? Do you attend church, or are you a part of the church? There's a difference. There's a difference between just showing up, and there's a difference between participating and knowing that you have a place in the body of Christ. So Ephesians 4.12 tells us the role of the fivefold ministry. I actually had to count it out to make sure it was the fivefold ministry. So it's to equip the saints for the work. Oh, I'm sorry. So the fivefold ministry is the pastors. We'll start at the beginning. The apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the shepherds, or pastors and teachers. So that's the fivefold ministry. And their job is to equip the saints. It's an equipping of the saints for the, ministry, for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. So that means Pastor Russ isn't the church. It's not his job. It's your job and your job and your job and your job and your job. It's our job. And Pastor Russ is to equip us for that job. But if we step back and say, oh, that's not my job. It's pastor's job to visit the poor. It's pastor's job to visit the sick. It's pastor's job to help the needy. I'll give him a check in the mail every now and then. He'll take care of it. Don't worry. No, that's our job. We are the body of Christ, and it's pastor's job to equip us. So what does that mean to equip us? Okay? So this is in the Greek, and I don't know Greek, but I'm going to try to pronounce it. It's uh, car catartis mos, all right? Is it up there? Oh, thanks, Alex. Well, you can pronounce it. It's all there. You can say it yourself. I don't have to. And that means a complete or furnishing, a perfecting, like you'd furnish a house. Like when I first bought my house, it was so empty, and there was nothing in it. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff got into my house. How did that, how did that happen? I must have bought it and put it in there, because now it's full of stuff, and I'm trying to get rid of it. So... It's a furnishing. It's making it ornate, furnishing of us, a perfecting. And it's also derived from the other Greek word, katardizo. Oh, look, there it is. And that means to complete thoroughly, a repair, adjusting, fit, frame, mend, perfecting, join, prepare, restore. You know we're a ragtag group of people? Every single one of us. We all need a little bit of restoring in our lives. We all need a little bit of preparing in our lives. A little bit of sanding down on those rough edges. That's pastor job is to, you know, sand us down a little bit. You know, make sure that you're ready to do your work. Mending, perfecting. And as workers, we need to allow that to happen to us, okay? In Matthew 7, 3 through 5, Jesus says, Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly enough to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So when we read scripture, there's a conviction in scripture. There's also an encouraging in scripture. But to do the work of the ministry, we need to allow God to perfect us, to take that log out of our eye, because our brother does need help getting that speck out of his eye. Have you ever tried to help somebody get a, like a fly out of their eye? And you're like, no, really, trust me, as you're going at their eye with like this napkin or something, and they're like, okay, I trust you. I mean, you got to make sure that you can see before you can take out the, the fly that's in your neighbor's eye. So make sure that your eyesight is good, your spiritual eyesight is good, and not hindered by any logs. 
So Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of Christ. He gave, that's what that beginning verse says, he gave. God gave us, Pastor Ross. God gave us Linda. God gave us the leaders in the church to equip you for the ministry. They're a gift from God. See, now you know why we get to say all the things about Pastor when he's not here. You know, Pastor Appreciation Month. I'm glad he's not here today. So he's a gift from uh, uh, God to us. Linda is a gift from God to us. Think of how much they have blessed you this past year. Not just this past year, but however long you've known them. You know? What a blessing. What a gift. But they are equipping us for the work of the ministry. Well, what does ministry mean? Am I the only one ministering here because I'm standing up in front of you? Because you can see me standing up here. I must be the only one ministering. No, that is wrong. Okay, the person standing up front is not the minister. You are the ministers. All right? And in the Greek, here we go again. I'm going to butcher this one too. Diakonos. I can't pronounce it. And, and that means an attendant, a waiter, specifically a Christian teacher and pastor, a deacon, a minister, a servant. Christianity is serving. And what a better teacher than Jesus who taught us. So in John 13, 12 through 17, and when he, Jesus, had washed their feet, he washed their feet and he put on his outer garment and resumed his place and he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you that, to do them. What an honor to be called a minister. What an honor to serve other people, to be a servant. As many of you know, I'm a nurse, and... I don't want to say that, but throughout the years, I've kind of, you, you know, you kind of, I don't want to say work your way up, but when I first started out, I was a CN, like, they, they have different names now, but, like, I was a CNA, and so I would have to feed people, and I, I absolutely loved it. But then when you get more responsibility, um, you start doing other things, and now I find myself sitting at the computer charting all day long. But anyway, I had the honor of feeding someone. And I thought, man, it's been years since I've had to feed another person. They can do nothing for you. It, when someone can't feed themselves, they're at a point in their life where they can't even help themselves. And, and I thought, wow, what a blessing to be able to feed another person, the most simplest thing in life that we all take for granted, to be able to minister to someone who can't even thank you the person couldn't even thank me. But what an honor that was. And that's how we need to come into the ministry. What an honor to help this person, even if they can never thank me for it. Even if they're maybe so mad or so embarrassed or just so caught up in their own problems that they don't even know how to thank you for being kind to them. This is why we go into ministry to help others. This is why we are Christians, because Christ forgave us Christ died for us so that we can forgive others, so that we can serve others just like Jesus served us. Yeah. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, it says, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and carry out the ministry God has given you. Sometimes it's a suffering to serve others. 
But it says, keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of that suffering. Work at telling others the good news and fully carrying out the ministry God has given you. Because you have a ministry. You have a ministry. You have a ministry. I wanted to do that Oprah thing. So. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. We all have a ministry. And it's different than just what we think it is. Standing up in front, preaching. That's that's part of the ministry, but that's the part that equips us to do the work. Amen. And like I said, sometimes ministry isn't always what you think it, it is. It's not all the big glamour. It's not all the glory. Matthew 6, 1 through 5 says it shouldn't be all the glamour and glory. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Oh, what? But I did such a good thing. I should put it on Facebook. I should let everybody know that I helped this person. In fact, I'm going to tape myself helping this person so everybody could see how good I am. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You know, we're in a secret society where we do everything in secret, doing your righteous deeds in secret. All right, verse 2. Then, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before them. I'm sorry. Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. We should, who should we be giving the praise to? God. To God. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. All those people, you know, those YouTubers who are like, hey, look, I just gave this guy $100. Look at me, you know. That, that, they can have that reward because we do our deeds before the Father in secret. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Did you know that the ministry that Pastor Russ has, or the ministry that, of, of speaking in front of people, or um, you know, a lot of you think, oh, he just writes a sermon twice a week, and, and that's all he does, and why doesn't he have time to, to meet with me or something like that? Because a lot of what he does is in secret. I don't know who he speaks to throughout the week. I don't know who he counsels. I don't know where he has to run to or do this or do that. And when a lot of um, honor is given to someone, like we, we, Pastor Russ is, a, is our pastor. He's a shepherd of our church. He lives his life in secret before God. And that's what we need to be doing. He gets up early in the morning. And, I, and when we know this because he talks about it. Spends time with the Lord reads his Bible, prays, that's in secret. That's where the preparation of the heart begins. That's where our ministry, that equipping with God begins, in secret. And that's why Monica and Pastor Russ have been toting this, read through the Bible in a year. Not because reading through the Bible is a good thing, but because it will equip you for the ministry that God has for you. And it begins in secret between you and your father. You need to know scripture for yourself. You need to be doing what it says in scripture for yourself. It's not pastor's job, it's our job. Matthew 6, 1 through 2. Oh, we already, we already said that, how we shouldn't be. I'm not going to read it yet. Don't do your righteous deeds before others. We need to be doing that in secret. So one of the, the things as I was reading this, it, it talks about don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, okay? When we, and, and the other word that I liked that it said is when you are practicing your righteous deeds before others. Uh, I want to use my drum set as, as an example. So when I started out, like, it would bore you if you had to listen to me practice. Like, nobody wants to, 
Dave, how long did you have to sit and listen to all the young violin students practice? It's not fun to listen to people practice, okay? But that's what's needed, and it happens in secret, and that's where our, our Bible studying, our reading is happening in secret. There's a lot, we come to the Lord with a lot of issues and problems, and we're like, okay, Lord, your word says this, but I'm not living this way, and I don't know how to handle this, so you're going to have to take care of it. We come to the Lord a mess, okay? With, with that, just like I come to the, my drum set, a mess. But what you see is hours of practice. But none of you actually see me practice. You don't, you don't know the hours that I have spent doing that. And I can tell you, I don't know sometimes what my right hand and my left hand is doing. And that's what it says in scripture. You need to get to the point where you don't know what your right hand and what your left hand is doing, where it just flows out of who you are, where you're just doing righteous deeds because of the scriptures that God has put inside of you, because of the prayers that you have talked to him about, it just becomes a part of you, flowing out from you. And that's why it's so important to have that time with the Lord. So your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing, where everything is just a rhythm before the Lord. So we talk about equipping the saints. That's between you and God. That pastor says, pastor stands up, he gives the messages, equipping us for the ministry. That's between you and the Lord. But then he also is for the building up of the body of Christ. And so this is all of us, okay? There's the individual, and now there's all of us, the body of Christ. Um, I'm just going to read it again, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner, oh no, I'm sorry, Alex. We'll read the first part in Ephesians. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, this is Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up of the body of Christ. Okay. So for the building up of the body of Christ. I don't know what it is, but like, like I said, I, I work in healthcare, and there's something really cool when you are struggling with something and things aren't going good and all of a sudden everything goes good and you're like, boom, high five, because you're doing it as a team. I don't know how many times I've gone through and been like, high five to my coworkers because we are doing it as a team. We are trying to help this person as a team. Each one of us is individually trained, but together we come together as a team to get the hard work done. And that's the same way here in the body of Christ is God does that individual training and then we come together as a team, high five, you know, where we are out ministering, we're out helping others. It's not an individual thing. We are the body of Christ, okay? And I don't know what it is, but like three times this week I've heard someone be like, hey, teamwork makes the dream work. And I'm like, okay, you know, and it's true. When we come together, the, think, think of everything that all the prophets have, have spoken, all, all that has prophetically been in, in Scripture. We come together as a body, as a unity of believers, and things happen. Our work together in unity. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all. And who is over all and through all and in all. There's one Jesus. There's one Lord. One body. And we are that body. And every church in Eau Claire is part of that body. Every believer you meet walking out on the street is part of that body. It's not solely to New Beginnings Church. It's we are the body of Christ. And if there is a break in unity, 
if there is an issue between brothers or sisters, we have to be so quick to address that, to talk to each other, to pray about it, to take it to the Lord, so that we can have that unity in our body. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Take care of business right away. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits its occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgave you. He's our, he's our example. Jesus is our example. I have done things to offend the Lord, and on a daily basis I come before him, and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. And he reminds me, because of his great forgiveness for me, I need to extend that to other people. I need to be walking in his grace for others, because we're family. We are the family of Christ. We're the body of Christ. I grew up in a large family. There are so many characteristics There's of individuals in a family. So many of us would be fighting and arguing and bickering, but you know what? When we were together as a unit, we can accomplish so much. And even now, like I, I, I just call up one of my brothers and sisters. I'm like, hey, I need you to, yep, I'll be right there. I don't even have to say what I need, and they're there to help me out. That's how we need to be as a family where we put aside our differences and come together in the name of Jesus and help each other out. All right. So where do you fit in? Where do I fit in into this big old body of Christ? Well, let's read Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 again. It's always good to read things over and over again. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by cunning, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up every way unto him who is ahead, unto Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly and the body grow, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we all have a part. And I read that first part about how pastor's job, the jobs of the evangelists, the teachers, all the fivefold ministry, it is for the work of the body, for the building up of Christ. Now this next part, this is our job, okay? Until we obtain the unity of faith, so that's one, the knowledge of the Son of God, that's two, to mature manhood, three, to the measure, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that's four. Those are the things we, that's our goal as a church. That's the goal of us ministers here in the body of Christ. So let's look at those four things. First one is unity of faith. I got something to say about faith, okay? When things are the hardest in life, that's when our faith shines the brightest. Because if everything was hunky-dory, you wouldn't need faith. You know, you, you still are like, God, you know, God, you'll take everything when, to care of everything when everything's already taken care of. That's great. But our faith grows when everything isn't being taken care of and everything looks like it's a mess. 
That's when our faith grows. That's when we need to stand on our feet and be, God, I trust in you. I trust in Jesus. You know, I was reading this morning about the, the, uh, the centurion who Jesus said, I haven't seen anybody with faith like this. And all the centurion said to God was, one, my servant's sick. So that's not a good thing if someone's sick. But the centurion didn't even go to Jesus. He said, if you just, but say the word, everything will be taken care of. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this. Well, God, you just say the word. I trust you. You're going to take care of it. So unity of faith, this is what we're working on in the church. This is our goal as a church. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come to see you or an absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened by anything, um, in anything by your opponents. Faith isn't afraid. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation that is from God, who has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, that you would not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul suffered a lot for his faith. Whenever you hear of faith, you also hear of suffering. That's because we don't see, faith sees the end point, okay? Even when it looks like you're wallowing in mud. You know, all we see with our physical eyes is, I'm in mud right now, and it is icky and gross, and I don't like it, okay? But faith sees God's going to get me out of it. That's what faith is. God is going to pull me out of it, and you just know that he is going to take care of it. No matter what, no matter if I die, I am in his hands. That's what faith says. Praise God. Praise God for faith and suffering. How would we ever make it through without Jesus? All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Because if we walked by sight, we'd all be hopeless and depressed. And blind. And blind. That's where God gives us spiritual sight is in faith that he is going to get us through this. We might not see the next step, but he sees it, and he's going to lead us. Our faith is in him. And the second one is knowledge of the Son of God. This is our goals of the church body. Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We have the joy of spreading that knowledge to others to speaking of that of others. That's what an evangelist does, tells others of the glory of God. Philippians 3, 8 through 11, it says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. This is Paul talking. He says, I count it all as loss because of the suppressing wealth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered. There's that word again, <laughs> suffered. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share in his sufferings, Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Praise to know God. We know, to, that, that was, Paul said, that is my goal, is to know him. Everything else I count as loss. Everything that I thought I obtained in this life, that I thought was really cool, I count it all as loss. If I can just know him. 
And sometimes we think we know a lot of things. 1 Corinthians 8, 2 through 3, it says, If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What would you rather know? You know, the president of some big old company who could give you millions of dollars. But if you're not known by God, what's the purpose of it all? And it says that if anyone loves God, he's known by God. What a beautiful thought. Just loving God makes me known by him. All right, another goal of our church, of the church, of the body of Christ is maturity. James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough, a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking nothing. When this verse first came to me, that last part, lacking nothing, is what compelled me to, to write this, is we come to God, you know, we don't know anything. We, we, we're just little babies in the faith. And then God develops us and brings us up and brings that maturity to where we find out, I am everything in Jesus. Every gift that God has is mine. And there's that maturity is our dependence on God to where we are perfect and completely developed, lacking nothing. And the last part is measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And um, that's in the ESV. In, in the New Living Translation, it's worded differently, and I'm going to start, uh, so Ephesians 4.13. It says, this will come until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. All right? And that word standard of Christ, it made me think of um, Daniel 5, 24 through 28 with the handwriting on the wall. I don't know if you remember that. But Daniel gave the, uh, int the prof prophetic interpretation of that. It says... Um, then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. So this is Daniel telling the king. Uh, mini, mini, tikal, and persen. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mini, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought them to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Parisians. So this king was found wanting. At the end of our lives, we don't want to be standing before God, being measured on the scales, and found wanting. And so in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, it says, Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and undefading, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, that for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved, grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the re revelation of Jesus Christ." Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, and though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It all comes down to our dependence on Jesus. Measure of the, st of the stature of the fullness of Christ is us being dependent on him for salvation in every aspect of our day. That's where our faith grows, is us being dependent for, him, for on salvation in him in every part of our daily lives. It's not just 
oh, I, um, I confessed my sins one time and became a Christian. No, we are daily coming before him, being dependent on his salvation for our souls. And it says here that that dependence on him is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. What a blessing. What a joy. So, we've talked about how Pastor Russ and Linda, they are pastors, they, they, the, part of the five-fold ministry, okay? And this being Pastor Appreciation Week, I want to end up this message talking about prayer. And as we spoke about before, how prayer needs to be in that secret place, don't be like the hypocrite standing on the corners, you know, praying before everybody. It's a prayer in the secret place. And um, there are prayer cards in the back on the table, that have these scriptures on them. Um, when I had been in prayer about this, the, uh, the plea of Paul in scripture was, please pray for me. So I looked up those scriptures where it said, please pray for me that I, Paul. And those are the prayers that I felt like we could be praying over Pastor and Linda. And so that they are on a little, I don't know, you could put it in your Bible as a bookmark if you want to take it home. But these are some of those, those prayers um, that I, I want to discuss right now. And uh, the, the first one is uh, on the prayer card is in Matthew, and I don't have that verse in front of me, but it's where Jesus says, pray for the workers of the harvest. And that's us. We find ourselves praying and all of a sudden, we find ourselves working. We are the answer to someone's prayers. You know, when, when Jesus said, you know, pray that God sends workers. The harvest is ripe. It's ready. We are those workers. And as we pray, there, there are things that pastor needs help with. There's things that Linda needs help with. And it begins with our prayers for them. And then pretty soon we find ourselves being the ones volunteering which is what God wants, to prepare our hearts for that ministry. So that was the first one. And the second one is Matthew, oh, I'm sorry, Romans 15.30. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me given to you by the Holy Spirit. Um, I had talked with someone from another church and, uh, and this person said, you know, I don't even think to pray for my pastor. I don't, I've never really considered it. It's not something I do on a regular basis. Well, this is something we need to put in our forefront. It needs to be, we need to be praying for Pastor and Linda, for the leaders, for the elders on a regular basis. We, every day, they go through struggles that we don't even know you know, it says we do not fight against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. You know, if there's, there, there are fights going on in the spirit against our pastor that we don't even know about. And we need to make this a priority because we are the ministers of the body. This is our job, is to make it a priority. And so when we are praying for our pastor, for Pastor Russ, for Linda, for, for the elders, for the leaders, we are joining them in their struggle. We're part of the body. And you're joining them in a spiritual struggle. And it says, do this because of your love for Pastor Russ, for Linda. And, and that love is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And so, so I'm just going to pray, Lord, put it on each of our hearts and our minds right now to uphold our pastors, our leaders in prayer in a daily basis so that we can be part of what you are doing in this land. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's the first one. And the second, or actually on the card, it's the second one. The third one is Colossians 4, 2 through 4. It says, Continually, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. 
And there's a couple things in that verse that we can use to be in praying for our pastor. And one is, you know, continue steadfast in prayer, being watchful and with thanksgiving. And then that's just our regular prayers. And as we're doing that on a daily basis, it says praying that God would open a door for the word. That's something that we can be in prayer for, opening a door in the word in Eau Claire, in Wisconsin. In, I mean, God's opened up doors for us as a church throughout this nation, throughout the different countries in the world. We can be in prayer that God opens up a door for the ministry, that his word spreads through our church, through our body. And it says also that, that when it's spoken, that the word is spoken, that we would make it clear as we ought to speak. We can pray that for each other because... As we go throughout our day, we come in contact with different people all the time. We need to make that message clear. We can be in prayer as a body that the message is spoken clear. And Paul says, and that's how I ought to speak. And so we can be in prayer over that. And the last one is 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us, for the word of God, of the Lord. Um, I'm sorry, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. And again, there's, there's different keys in that scripture. That the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. That's what we want as a body, as a church, that God's word goes swiftly out. You know, that it is glorified, that Jesus is glorified as the word goes out. And that, that um, if people are going to be unreasonable and wicked, you know, God would just make a way for his word to continue to go forth. Um, we, want, we don't want to be bogged down by people who aren't going to be listening to God. People are, different, are at different stages of their life. And, um, and I've known people who've been unreasonable and wicked at one stage of their life, and on fire for Jesus at another stage of their life. And uh, we need to be praying that Pastor Russ isn't bogged down with stuff and that he can take that word and just run swiftly with it and God, let God take care of the rest. So let's just take a moment to be in prayer for our pastor because he's not here, so we can do that. And... Um, Let's just all of us settle our hearts right now and just be thankful for the ministry that God is developing in each one of us. The, the ministry of calling others to Jesus, you know, being, becoming more mature in Christ, he's got something for every one of us and we need to come before him and um, be obedient to the things that he's putting on our hearts to do. So, Lord God, I just thank you for our pastors, for Pastor Russ and Linda, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you have put them in a place of leadership over our church body, Lord. I thank you for all the gifts that you have given to each one of them, Lord God. They're so various um, in, in just how you have placed them in our church body, Lord God. What a blessing they are to us, Lord God and that you've put on them that equipping, um, that, that weightiness of how, of how they can equip us to do your work, of how they can equip the body of Christ to do your work in this land. And Lord, help us as ministers that you're equipping us to be in the body of Christ to do our part, where every part is functioning the way it needs to, that we are responsible for our part we're responsible for, to read your word, as Pastor tells us, to be in prayer, as Pastor and Linda have told us, Lord God. Lord, help us to do our part in that so that we are whole and complete in you, Lord Jesus, lacking nothing, Lord God. As we move forward in this land that is in so need of you, Lord Jesus, let your church light shine in this dark land, Lord God, that you would be glorified, Lord Jesus, that you would set hearts free, Lord God, 
that you would set lives free so that they too can be part of the body of Christ, so they too can find their place in you, Lord God. Lord, help us to be in prayer for our pastor, for Pastor Russ, for Linda, Lord God. Place it in our hearts. Help us to make that a priority, Lord God. You are doing wonderful things in this land. And we want to work with you, Lord God, and not against you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for every person here, my brothers and my sisters, Lord Jesus. We are your family, Lord God. And I just pray your blessings on them, Lord God. And Lord, I ask that as um, we do honor Pastor Russ and Linda, this, not just this month, but all the time, Lord, that they would feel honored, Lord, that they would be blessed by the things we've written in the notes or however, Lord, but they would just be blessed and they would know how precious they are to each one of us. And we thank you and we praise you and we give you all honor and glory because you've put us all together, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Monica snuck up there. I didn't even see her. Let's worship God together. One last song. And then let's not forget to tell Pastor and Linda how much they mean to us. But let's have one song together. As God's kids, let's worship him. To him who sits on the throne that you've put in our lives to bless us, to lift us up, to edify us, to exhort us, and help us to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week.